Hi, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety, and welcome to this Q&A with The Masked Singer. At this time, I am so pleased to introduce the show's costume designer. She is a five-time Emmy Award winner. She's worked with legendary artists from Taylor Swift to Katy Perry, and designed for such shows as So You Think You Can Dance and World of Dance. Please welcome Marina Toybina. Well, hi, Janelle. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. You are absolutely the biggest star on Masked Singer, in my opinion. Um, but I actually want to go back to the beginning and ask, what was sort of your first job in the business? You know, uh, I know you've done fashion and design and costume. Where did you sort of get your start? I um, st started um, attending um, the Fashion Institute of Designing Merchandising when I was 18, right out of high school. Um, I got my degree in fashion design. And my original platform was fashion design. It was ready to wear or couture runway. That was my expertise. Um, so the beginning of my career actually kind of started with one of a kind pieces. I had my own brand for a few years um, and then started teaming up with stylists, choreographers, directors, slowly kind of weaning my career into more upstage life performances. And then somehow found my niche in costume design and was able to kind of combine all the knowledge, all the techniques, all the experiences, and lead my way into um, booking the X Factor. That was my first TV show, X Factor US, and did that for three seasons and then kind of stayed in television. I just learned this this morning, and maybe you're sick to death of being asked about this, but you are responsible for the left shark yeah. uh, in Katy Perry, <laughs> Perry Super Bowl performance. Wow. That's how do you top that? Uh, Mass Singer. Um, I, I think, you know, looking back now, I, I'm so fortunate for the opportunity. That was an incredible um, kind of creative outlet for so many of us that were part of Super Bowl. And for me, it was, it was my first shot at learning how to build the big walkabouts, the, the big life-size puppets, masks, and, you know, learning how, how to fabricate different things aside from just using fabrics. And um, now looking back, that was kind of the beginning of my mass Singer career. Were you surprised by how obsessed and, and entertained people were by, by the dance of the shark dancers or did, did you yeah, sort of expect that? I think we were the last to know because right after Super Bowl, we went back to our hotel, my team and I, and we were packing everything away. Didn't realize that on a huge screen behind us, you know, the entire world, um, that it's breaking the internet, that it's this incredible phenomenon, that it's number one watch show in the history of halftime shows for Super Bowl. So we were kind of in our own world until my phone started going off. And wow. I, I was just so excited, you know, that we were able as a team um, create something that was so epic. And also um, Katie did a phenomenal job and every element of that show was just so extravagant and amazing and over the top. It, it was just, it felt incredible that we were able to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, people still talk about it today. I, I, I love it. I love it's become oh, part of our I lexicon. Still, yeah, I still see little doggies <laughs> in shark costumes, you know, and for me, it was, um, I, I'm still processing, I think, you know, until this day, I, I didn't realize it was going to be such a culture phenomenon, such a big part of pop culture. Um, and, and like I said, all the experiences that I got from that just led me to bigger jobs, bigger opportunities, and I, I'm happy it's still around. I'm hoping the baby shark song is somewhat have to do with it or maybe a completely <laughs> different entity, but never leave my house. <laughs> so now we're, we're deep into the fifth season right now of The Masked Singer. Um, but I actually want to go back to the beginning and talk about when the show first kind of came your way. Uh, what was sort of your reaction to this idea of disguising celebrities with elaborate costumes and having them participate in a singing contest? Because in so many ways, it shouldn't work. And yet it's so joyous and so much fun and so creative. <laughs> I think you just, you kind of just hit it on the spot because it shouldn't have worked. I think <laughs> that's where the platform was just so empty for us to start with a blank canvas and, and figure out these unique ways to build a show. Um, when I first got the pitch, uh, I went through all the decks. I, I watched the Korean version and I, for me, I was obsessed. You know, I, I got a chance to speak to the showrunner immediately and be like, okay, walk me through this. How do we do this? What can I do? Um, it was right up my alley. I loved, um, I, personally, I just love the bigger, the better, you know, the more extravagant and um, the more storytelling we can do with costuming. And I also thought it was such a, a beautiful platform for costume design. You know, you, you see these type of costumes in film, you see it on bigger screens. Not rarely do we see it being able to, you know, come onto a platform like a reality show or a competition show. So for me, I was just so excited and so honored to have been asked, um, you know, to be interested in the project. 
So I am, um, you know, from, from the beginning to end, again, it's going back to all the experiences that I had. Um, prior to that, I, I, I was part of the Pink um, Beautiful Trauma Tour. Mm -hmm. So on that tour, we were actually able to experience with masks and kind of experiment with different ways to collaborate costuming with the idea of creatures. So again, for me, it was like baby steps leading me into almost what seemed to be meant to be, you know, um, coming on board for the mass Singer. And I mean, from the very start, I remember that very first season, your costumes stole the show. Uh, coming into the new season, can you talk about the discussions you have in creating these designs? I, I don't really know, like, do you come up with the idea? Is it a discussion? I, I've noticed in the past, some have been more straightforward, like the Rottweiler, and then something like the Night Angel is, is so open to interpretation when you hear that. And I think uh, the beautiful thing about Messinger, as I said, we're walking every season, we're walking into blank canvas. Of course, we know our demographic. We know what has worked in the past, what have been fans' favorite. I pay attention to even like the little letters, fan mail I get from kids, what they would love to see on the wow. show. So for us, you know, going from season one, kind of figuring out the trials and errors, figuring out how to evolve the show. Um, I brought a, a slightly different approach to the Korean version where we did our own version of the 360 masks. We didn't do just the front face mask. Um, and then I wanted to create stories with all the characters, whether it's spot on or you kind of, like you said, left to interpretation. I, I wanted the character already to be so mesmerizing on stage. And then we have room to grow and we have room to develop, you know, with song choices and the performances. How do these characters kind of become this visual stimulation? Um, so from season one to season five now, um, every season I'm trying to evolve. You know, I'm growing with the show. I'm learning my creative outlets, bringing in more people on board, researching different fabricators, um, different things that we can bring forward in, into all of our builds, learning different technology. So for me, I'm constantly trying to figure out, you know, with a collaboration of the producers and our entire team, what has worked, you know, um, also, all the feedback that I get from our um, celebrities, you know, from our casting talent, for me, the key is the fittings. That's when we kind of get to communicate and I try to figure out, um, did my ideas tra transition the right way into the actual builds? You know, what are the technical issues we need to work out? How can we perfect the costume until it's on stage? Um, so it's always growing, always evolving. And with season five, we see new things now brought into the show. Um, I finally start using animatronics even on a smaller scale, we saw a little bit of it in the serpent and now we were able to see it in snail. Um, you know, being able to work with 3D printing, which again, like I said, those are all elements that you see in features, but we are now trying to figure out how to bring them to our stage. And I think it's been phenomenal for, you know, for me to see kind of this wondrous world of um, anything can happen. It, it, for me, it's like the motto for the show. So you must be one of the only people on the show who knows who the celebrities are. One of the few, yes. Wow, you must be so good at keeping secrets. You know, we dive in into this world of art and um, I, I understand the platform of the show. We never wanna give anything away. And because the talent is so committed, you know, to working with us and making sure everything goes smoothly and, and who wants to, you know, to kind of let it all out before yeah. the actual guessing point of the show. So I think that's what keeps it interesting as well. So people don't bother you for clues? like your friends and family? No, I think we just died. I, I don't think my family still understands what I do for a living. So that's, <laughs> you know, I, I think my husband kind of knows I am a costume designer, but he doesn't know what that means. Um, so it, it's wonderful for me. I'm left alone as far when it comes to that. But um, from the beginning of knowing who's being casted on the show, it, for me, it's truly focusing on creating art, you know, mm -hmm. and we're on a, such an intense type span and um, limited kind of avenues how to go about this that, everything becomes about building um, communication, transparency within our teams and, and kind of going to town. How much say, if, if any, do the celebrities have in collaborating with the costumes? Like, do, do you give them a few to pick from or they sort of tell you what they like? For me, it's always an open book. And I think because I'm providing a service for them and they have to be the one to execute it on stage, I, I'm open to any suggestions and ideas. Usually our process works to where prior to every season, I do kind of um, my creative renderings of what new characters could look like. Um, these are our artistic pitches that then go to the network. We collaborate together with the producers, figure out what we'd like to see on the show. Um, and then from there, it, it's a domino effect. You know, once casting comes forward, uh, we pitch a few ideas that I think are either perfect for that particular person or slightly even, you know, 
in a completely left field of who they are so that we can divert our audience in a different direction. Um, they either love the sketches right away or can relate to the characters that we're proposing or they give me their feedback of things that, hey, I love this, but I have you know, an attachment to something here. Can we bring this into the costume? So it's always an open kind of ended conversation, which is wonderful because then I know they're gonna love you know, the final outcome and I get to really understand where these characters are going. What are their stories now that there's extra kind of input involved? Um, and then again, we collaborate during fittings. Has there ever been someone who you sort of, sort of started from scratch once you started talking to them? Like maybe they didn't respond to any of the initial ideas and after talking to them, you actually designed specifically for them? Oh, it happens every season, you know, um, and it's not a bad thing. I'm kind of used to it now. Yeah, yeah. The first time it happened, I was like, ooh, but um, I, I'm finally understanding, you know, the process of the entire show to where for us to really reach that platform of excitement and our artistry and innovation, all input has to be welcomed, you know? So we've had a few moments and I'm starting to mix all the seasons in my head because we've had so many costumes. But for instance, I believe it was season two when we had the Christmas tree, you know, that's something that was very important um, to bring forward to life. You know, it followed with the story of the talent having an um, album release. So all these things meant so much sense for me to then follow through and create an original kind of concept based on um, our celebrities booking. So it happens all the time and we, we work together. And I've been lucky so many times where right away, they love the artwork, they get, they, they understand my story, they understand what this character means. Um, and, and I try to usually showcase that right away through the artwork, you know, where we have the giraffe, where you see that there's a period, there's a Marie Antoinette kind of a um, color um, ombre that's going through the whole thing. So I show them the ambiances and you know, we, we've been very lucky and fortunate with so many of our talent. Yeah, I love that it's like not just a kangaroo. It's a kangaroo right. with boxing gloves. Right. You know, things like that are so creative. I love to um, bring forward a mystique right away, you know, and where the talent takes it. Like I said, a lot of it has to do with the mobility that they want to bring to stage with the choreography, with song choices are key. Costumes come alive with music. That's what the show is about, you know, and then with extraordinary voices that some of them have or or bigger than life personalities. I think that's when you see all this beautiful detailed work come to life. I mean, after five seasons, I'm guessing you've picked up some tricks and hints, but when designing the costumes, they also have to be functional for singing and dancing. Have you sort of perfected that over trial and error? I've been lucky enough in my career to work with so many dancers and educating myself on the proper techniques of sewing, the right fabrications, being able to do all the world tours where the costumes have to sustain themselves and have durability and have mobility. Um, so coming onto the show, I, I come with all that history of knowledge as to what we can do to enhance each performance and each performer in our costumes. Um, when it comes to the bigger build, uh, like I said, I, I always bring in experts. All of our fabricators, we collaborate with since stage one to end. You know, I never stop these builds until they're on stage and even in between shows we add more and we create more to, to fix all the little tweaks or just provide a, bit, a bigger world of artistry. For this season, what are the costumes that have been the most challenging? I think we raised the bar with season five and I am so excited to and so proud. Um, I think with the Russian dolls, that yes. was something that was so <laughs> important. I'm Russian, born in Moscow. So for me, that to bring that to life um, was not just sentimental and, and special, but then I got to work with the Hanson brothers who I grew up on and was the biggest fan. So it was a double win. And um, just the challenges there, the guys were incredible to work through with us, um, work through all this kind of elements, going from giant builds to scaling them down, perfecting the artwork, um, being able to scale our faces that they still have consistency. Every doll was hand painted. We've tried all the techniques that we could to airbrush them or print on them. And finally, at the end of the day, we're like, no, we're going to have to hand paint every little detail, work out all the structures, how to make this dolls mobile, how to create all the airways of, of vision and being able to breathe and still articulate the music. So to me, that was probably the biggest challenge. And it's also because we created an extra character. You know, we didn't stop at just three dolls. We renumbered the design to where it could constantly become a game uh, with every performance and keep the guys kind of on their toes. Um, so it, that, that was probably the hardest for me this season or the most challenging. 
Um, but then all the costume kind of had those extra moments. Um, the Yeti being able to consistently light the mask from within and still create these overextensive builds and um, limbs and, and these interesting builds and let him be mobile and perform and have fun on stage. Um, the snail, you know, uh, being a big one for us. Um, like I said, bringing animatronics into a costume where it, it's able to kind of maneuver on stage and be self-sufficient. So there's so much. The chameleon, you, I, I can just keep talking because every costume for me was so strategic and thought out and the work that went into it, the details, you know, on the chameleon, for instance, every star was hand sewn, everything was cut out and placed properly, you know, down to the right fit and the body type that we're working with, oversizing the mass to compensate for the height. Um, it, yeah, I can keep going forever. I just want to go back to the Russian dolls real quickly because it's it's such a cool idea. Um, what did you sort of think when a, when a trio was first suggested? When you hear that, do you kind of get nervous or do you get excited? <laughs> I get nervous before every show. I get, I still get nervous and, and stressed out before every job because I know that I have to raise the bar, then I have to raise the expectations for my team and everybody else that's involved. Um, when I heard it was a trio, I gasped for air because I knew that something was coming my way that was either out of this world or we just wouldn't figure out, you know, in time how to pull it off. Um, but I think having the Russian doll idea has been floating around the show for a few seasons now. Um, I originally did a sketch for season two and it just wasn't the right fit. It wasn't the right booking. We couldn't really figure out how to pull it off in such a unique way that it really kind of um, follows through with the tradition of what this doll is. Um, and then when I, I heard that there was a bigger casting on the show, we were able to incorporate more people. It was kind of the right timing now to play with an idea. Um, and I, you know, we went back and forth with the boys many times. Are we making these modern dolls? Are we making them traditional? You know, is there a unique artwork that I can then set each doll being different? And then somehow them being who they are, it just made sense to make this identical kind of um, look and, and unique aspect to the show and kind of let them embody it with them being the handsome brothers. <laughs> I'm curious, how long does it take from like conception to fittings to design to actually get a completed costume? I'm sure it varies for each one. Usually we overlap all the costumes. I have about six to seven costumes on average where uh, somebody's building a mask, somebody's building feet, then we have a costume. You know, um, we are very limited on a time span to pull this off. Um, doing two seasons a year, you can imagine we end one, go straight into the next. Um, so on average, I have about four weeks to provide the artwork and tweak any kind of revisions or notes that we have. And then we have about two, two and a half to three months as we're even filming the show to pull all the builds together. And sometimes I have masks that we can miraculously design in under a week. And sometimes we have costumes that take four to five to six weeks, depending on the complex complexity of each of each design. I hate to ask you to choose a favorite, but I'm going to ask you to choose a favorite. Um, personally, what's been your favorite costume design over all these seasons? Wow, there's so many. I think, it, you know, every time I get asked that question each season, <laughs> my options just, I don't even know. My overall, my favorite season creatively, I'd probably say season five. And like I said, the, the dolls, um, Robo Pine, even the, the aspects of a superhero coming through that costume being half monster, half this incredible kind of um, Terminator type of a vibe. Uh, I, I love building that one. Um, then the White Tiger from season three, something I really enjoyed because it was the first time we were using techniques of airbrushing on fur and manipulating our textiles to create this incredible expression of a mask. Um, then the female costumes, Ladybug, the sun, um, I mean, there, there's just so many, but um, overall, if I had to truly pick one, two, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would probably say for me, the Russian dolls and the dragon. Oh, That's the dragon. Um, something about the simplicity and complexity and the balance between less is more, more is more, I think really worked in those two, in, in those two kind of designs. I mean, obviously, the last couple of seasons brought about a whole new set of challenge because of COVID right. protocols. How did that sort of change your day-to-day -day operations? 
with season four, I think that was the most challenging because we dived right in, you know, once uh, everybody went on lockdown and we were one of the first productions to open up, it, it was, how do we do this? How do we keep everyone safe? We're dealing with the unknown. Uh, we're dealing with this new mindset of being able, you know, being scared to even step outside and we have to continue and we have to work. So I think being careful about all the protocols, educating ourselves on, you know, where are the unions standing with our, with our particular department? Where is the show standing? Where is the network? What guidelines are we following? Um, a lot of our builds had to happen from home. Um, so you can imagine where I'm at, <laughs> driving around to everybody, as well as we were lacking resources. You know, stores were closed, um, had to dive into a lot of online now options of what's available. And imagine my fear of buying fabrics online. You know, I'm the one that usually oh goes God. and I have to touch and feel and see how can this be manipulated. And we have to take a leap of faith, you know, and really work together more than ever as a team. Um, to help one another, to even going back to the basics of design now. Like, okay, if we're only given these few resources and these th few outlets, what do we do? So we started using a lot of house paint rather than our brushing, a lot of hand detailing rather than machine stitching, and trying to figure out our own ways to dye materials and create fabrication. So season four, I think, um, was probably emotionally and physically and creatively the most challenging. And I think once we got through that platform and keeping our talent safe and figuring out how to do fittings when you're masked and, you know, in goggles and gloves, um, getting through all those little steps and, and still understanding that there's a bigger picture here is we have to all remain calm and safe and um, help each other out. I think for me, knowing all those challenges, season five was slightly easier, you know, and we just became more creative, more ambitious and, um, still working together as one big family, I guess. I mean, as things hopefully continue to shift back to normal, um, are there any sort of policies that you've adopted that you think you'll keep? Sometimes situations like this, we learn things that maybe we should have been doing all along. <laughs> You know, for me, I, I think what I've learned is communications and patience. And I think that's something I would love to mm. continue with my department um, because we had to really regroup and, and work together and work as one brain. Um, it gave me a platform to really see the inner talents of my team, you know, and, and who was really great at staying at home and delivering, who needed, you know, less micromanaging and, and who took the initiative. So I think it allowed me to give my team so much freedom to create and trust each other. That for me, those are the, the, the core pieces that I'm gonna now reinstall as values going forward and opening up the floor for so much creativity and individuality within my department. I should actually ask how many people are on your team? How many people are working on different costumes at once? Yeah, um, each season would kind of start with a skeleton team until casting starts moving forward and we grow um, as production kind of moves along. We start with about seven or eight of us um, and that's including the mask makers. And then we grow probably to 30, 40 people all working on this from different fabricated shops to different sewing outlets. And then internally, there's 30 of us on the lot. Wow. Um, but are you the only person who knows who the celebrities are or do they sort of have to know? Um, it's it's kind of spreads without our department. Um, of course, who's building the mask, who's there with me in fittings knows what talent they're assigned to. Um, we have every single person that's on the show we within our department we have a few customers that are assigned to that particular character so honest, honestly my last question is and i don't know if you can answer this or how much you can tell us but do you have any ideas already brewing for season six things you want to do things you're hoping to accomplish i mean you have to keep raising the bar i don't know how you do it <laughs> Um, there, there's things we're playing with right now, you know, um, and of course, like coming up such a high of season five, as I mentioned, we've tried so many new techniques and so many new elements. Um, right now, we're brainstorming. We're really brewing as to what is that next level for us, you know, and also keeping it with enough momentum that we can grow for, you know, future and, and other seasons. Um, You'll, you'll never know. But um, yes, we're definitely in the talks of trying to figure out all the artistic elements, taking it. I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, it is such a fun show. The costumes are such a delight. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited. And, and I'm just happy that it's a show that everyone's still enjoying. So that's, that's incredible.